Well, hello there. Welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the membership of Texas government 2306. And we're going to be talking about political participation today. And that means parties, uh, political parties, voting, elections, interest groups, uh, public opinion, uh, all sorts of good stuff. All sorts of good stuff. Now, first of all, do you have any questions about where we have been so far about the tests, about our meetings or anything of that nature. Uh, any questions in general about the class that you'd like to address before we get started? How is everyone? Uh, anybody? Pretty good. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm was afraid everybody was asleep and not there. <laughs> uh, and it's such a nice day, and here we are stuck on a computer screen. Isn't that awful? Gee, many cricket. It's just not right. Um, I had an uncle who was not an uncle, but a cousin who was a superintendent of public school somewhere in Texas. Can't remember where. And one of his teachers was a guy who later became a TV star on the TV show Bonanza from the 1960s. His character was named Haas on the TV show. Dan Blocker was the guy's name. But he was a teacher then at that time. And he was always on a nice day like this. And if he was housing class in his room, he'd take everybody outside. And there was a big oak tree and there was a couple of big stumps under the tree. And kids would just sit under the tree on the stumps and, and wherever else they could grab a comfortable place. And he'd have class there under the tree. The My cousin, the superintendent said, you know, you're, Danny, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to stay in the classroom. Well, they learn better when they got some sunshine and some fresh air. How do you argue with that? So I wish we could walk outside, but you can't plug your... Uh, computer into a tree stump to get the internet. So here, here we are. Here we are. Anyway, uh, all sorts about political parties and, and the Texas party history. Uh, just a few things initially. Uh, the Democratic Party in Texas, for instance, we have a two party system, essentially. Oh, yes. The two principal political parties in the United States are what? The Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And if you are, as I've asked you to, following the news to some extent, watching the TV news, uh, reading Texas, uh, 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 oh, uh, oh, the website for the Texas uh, a newspaper, I can't think of the name of it right now. Isn't that embarrassing? Um, what's that online? Texas Tribune, the Texas Tribune, yeah, Tex texastribune.com. You're a Texas government student. You need to be reading that because I will ask some current events questions. I'm not going to go over them here because you just need to keep up with what's going on in Texas politics and Texas government. And probably that's your best bet. Used to be HCC's library had the Houston Chronicle and the Dallas Time, Dallas Morning News available to students, but no longer. I don't know why. It's not that they're saving that much money, but then again, I don't run the library and I don't get to have a say. And, and that's a shame because you should have access to newspapers without having to pay for them. But hey, this is HCC. <laughs> anyway, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. First of all, uh, Texas's political uh, political party history. The Democratic Party goes back to the 
uh, 19th century. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, 1800s, uh, the Democratic Party in the 1800s was pro-slavery. It was a party in the, principally in the South. And uh, here in Texas, of course, we were part of the Confederacy, the Southern states. Uh, and it, the Democratic Party was very segregated, uh, very segregationist uh, following the Civil War. Uh, if you were a uh, person who wanted to maintain the, the pride of the South and the whole plantation mentality where you had slaves instead of employees, uh, you were in the Democratic Party. The Republican Party was the party of, of, of Abraham Lincoln who wanted to you know, darn free those slaves. Darn as in the sense of that's the way the Texans and the South Southerners, the segregationists, felt at that time and for a long period afterwards. In fact, uh, the Texas Civil War, or, or the war against Mexico for Texas independence, was fought based on the idea of segregation being ended in Texas by the Mexican government. See, Mexicans, uh, the Mexican government did not permit slavery. And so they were forbidding the people who, the white people who moved to Texas and established ranches and, and, and farms uh, and kept slaves that they could not keep their slaves. And that's what led in part to the Texas Revolution against Mexico, which created the state of Texas. Well, the Republic of Texas first, uh, and then later joining the uh, Union as a state, and then being part of the Confederacy uh, during the Civil War. Um, in the South also, the Democratic Party in Texas, uh, uh, it was a vehicle of southern resistance to northern republican reconstruction after the civil war when the unification of the nation was being brought about because the confederacy lost and the northern states said okay you're doing away with slavery we're going to make sure you don't bring it back and you're going to do as you're told because we'll keep troops down there for a period of time uh, so the democratic party was a big part of a resistance to Northern Republican Reconstruction and dominance and, and of white opposition to full citizenship for black. They opposed it. Uh, in the 1940s, the Democratic Party was the opposition to the National Democratic Party's push for civil rights for African Americans, which started in the late 1940s. And it caused whites to leave the Democratic Party for the Republican Party. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, a Texas politician, and ran for Congress and then later for the Senate and later became president of the United, well, vice president of the United States with uh, John F. Kennedy in 1960 and then became president upon the assassination of John F. Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, Texas, when he was shot, we believe, by Lee Harvey Oswald, although there are theories that there were others involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. There are even theories that they were not shooting at Kennedy or whoever uh, wasn't shooting at Kennedy, but was shooting at John Connolly, the governor of Texas, Anyway, that's another matter entirely. So. But anyway, Lyndon Johnson as president uh, championed the adoption of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He was a major force in the civil rights movement in the 1960s and as president and the uh, pushing through of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And when he signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he turned to one of his aides and said, I have just killed the Democratic Party in the South. 
which to a large extent was actually true, which was to a large extent actually true because um, there were, the Democratic Party had its roots in the South and in Texas in um, segregation, segregation uh, to keep blacks from full participation, to keep black, uh, black citizens from voting and participating in political activity. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the history of the Democratic Party and the shift over to the Republican Party of a number of people. Uh, so, but anyway, Texas was uh, essentially a one-party state until around the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Democratic it was a period of realignment followed to parity between the two parties in the 1990s and beyond. Uh, Texas in the 1990s reverted back to being a one-party state again in the 1990s, this time Republican. And this time the Republicans were the people who were more conservative than the Democrats, because in the 1960s and 70s, the Democratic Party, even in the South, was much more, in many respects, becoming more liberal, whereas the Republican Party was becoming more conservative. Uh, realignment is a term referring to uh, a shifting in the political uh, affiliations. But the reasons for the realignment tied to civil rights activism of the National Party in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s came about because of the old issue of slavery. Uh, and the Democratic Party had been the party of segregation, conservatism, strong conservatism, but you had a shift later and those folks moved over and became Republicans. Uh, we have all sorts of special interest groups we can talk about in Texas and, and, and of course, in the nation as well. And we're talking about special interest groups. We're talking about political groups formed for business and trade associations like the, uh, there's a, I worked for the Texas Automobile Dealers Association. That's an example of a, a trade association. What did a trade association do? A type of interest group? Well, it lobbied the legislature and still does on behalf of new car dealerships for the state of Texas. Um, labor unions like the AFL-CIO and uh, other types of groups like that. Um, like I said, I used to work for the uh, automobile dealers in Austin in, 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 in their lobbying efforts, and I handled public relations and did some lobbying. Um, and I also was in charge of, like I said, public relations and um, printed material, and I traveled all over the state talking to newspapers about what we were doing on behalf of new car dealers and the economy of the state of Texas. Um, you had, you have all types of professional uh, interest groups that lobby on behalf of uh, the Texas, uh, Texas lawyers, uh, the Texas Medical Association, uh, the uh, uh, we've got agricultural groups that Texas Farm Bureau, for instance, they lobby on behalf of agricultural interests. If you are a farmer, you want to be involved in that because you want to have legislation to help farming and help uh, the rural uh, the rural economy. Uh, and there are agricultural groups that uh, represent bigger farms and corporate farms as well. And you've got racial groups and ethnic groups, uh, the NAACP, the Texas chapter of it, the League of Latin American Citizens and the Latin American Voters, uh, the Mexican American Democrats, uh, MAD. Uh, and you've got religious groups, 
particularly on the religious right, the Christian Coalition, Family Research Council, things of that nature, and public interest groups like the Sierra Club, Common Cause, National Abortion Rights Action League, the Right to Life Committee, NOW, National Organization of Women, New Texas groups that are affiliated with that, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, big operation in Texas as well, and interest groups lobby on behalf of their special interest groups. They involve themselves in electioneering, uh, getting people out to vote, getting campaign contributions through PACs. PAC stands for Political Action Committee, where members will contribute to that political action committee, and then that political action committee will give money to campaigns of politicians running for office who pledge to support that special interest group. <coughs> and you do this in order to gain access to legislators and their efforts to then make bills on behalf and pass bills for the special interest groups. Uh, they involve themselves with incumbents to be able to convince them, people who are in office, to vote on behalf of the interest of the interest groups, special interest groups gives them access to the legislative process, the interest group, uh, things of that nature. And lobbying, lobbying uh, members of Congress, members from Texas, members of the congressional staff, same way for the Texas legislature. You, you've got lobbyists that constantly are in the Texas legislature on behalf of business groups, professional groups, all of that sort of thing, lobbying the legislature to pass bills on the, their behalf. Uh, and a lot of these lobbyists are former politicians themselves because, hey, you make a hell of a lot more money when you're out as a lobbyist because you're getting paid big bucks now. You're not getting paid much money when you're in the legislature, although you can practice your law license yeah, with your law license uh, but uh, that's on the side when you're not uh, in uh, in session uh, uh and, and 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 most lobbyists are former members of the legislature or former staff people that worked in congress or in the texas legislature or or, or in the governor's office or one of the state agencies things like that Lobbying is big business. You make a hell of a lot of money, like I said. You can also have a heck of a lot of influence in doing that. And how do they persuade? Well, do they threaten members of Congress? Well, if you don't vote our way, we'll, we'll ruin you. That's counterproductive. You don't want to threaten members of the legislature because they can hurt you worse than you can hurt them if you're a lobbyist. And... They, they know better than doing that kind of thing. But they what they do is they inform members of what they need. Because why? They want their money. The members of the legislature want campaign contributions from these special interest groups so that they can run for office because they want to stay in the legislature because that gives them power. That gives them the ability to, if they stay for a while, you know what they become after they get defeated or decide to retire from being in the legislature? They become, what? Lobbyists and make bundles and bundles of money lobbying their old friends in the legislature. I remember being at a party uh, down in Austin when I was working for the Automobile Dealers Association. Oh, all sorts of politicians, Speaker of the House of representatives in the Texas legislature, Billy Clayton, was there at the party. Why? Because the TADA had a lot of money and a lot of influence. Our boss, the, the lo head lobbyist, was a former member, nearly the Speaker of the House himself at one point. So he knew that Billy Clayton, that you're going to be, if they're going to be throwing a party, going to be some movers and shakers there. And so I want to be there raising money for myself and raising political capital. Uh, but th this is this is what happens. This is this is 
how political parties work. These are how uh, interest groups work. Uh, they, um, they also will contact legislatures who disagree with their goals, as well as people who are sitting on the fence and can't decide what to do in order to get them uh, to support their goals. And this whole thing of access to the legislatures, the legislators and executive branch officers is the first step that makes persuasion possible. Because nobody, you just can't walk in and and sit down and start talking to the member of the legislature. They're busy. But if you are a lobbyist who have campaign contributions to give, hey, come on in, we'll talk. And that gives the lobby power. And that's what it's all about. Uh, and by the way, one thing you do as a lobbyist, you never lie. You never lie to a member. Why? Because if you do, every member of the legislature will find out because they'll talk and say, the guy lied to me. He was jerking me around. He's dead, dead, dead here in Austin. I've heard that. I saw it. Uh, these interest groups even write legislation and give to members of the legislature to introduce. I remember one time being in the legislature and watching uh, a bill being introduced and the members actually would look up in the gallery where the lobbyists were sitting because it was a new bill and it was introduced by those sets of lobbyists that were up in the gallery at that particular moment. And they'd look and go, the member would look up and go, and the guys would go, Vote no, vote no, you know, thumbs down, vote no, or vote yes, vote yes, and so they go. And then they'd go vote that way. That's the kind of influence the lobby has. That's part of the political power of interest groups. Uh, it's a good job if you ever want to get involved in it. And if you go and work in for a legislature, let somebody run in for the legislature and you go to work for them, you can learn how it all works and go to work there as a lobbyist eventually. Have a good career. But that's another thing entirely. That's it for those of you who are really interested in this stuff, which if you are, come see me. I'll get you linked up with some people. Uh, and, and I would encourage you, by the way, for your own well-being and advancement to get involved in a political campaign. Why? Well, I don't want to do it. I'm not interested. Do you want to have a good job when you get out of college? How do you meet the people who run big businesses, big corporations? You just walk in and say, could I speak to the president of this corporation? Because I'd like a good job here. Uh, no, you can't. Who are you? Well, I, I, I my teacher told me to talk to somebody in a big business, and if and if they like me, they'll give me a job. Uh, is he crazy? Well, maybe I didn't quite get it. Well, here's what I'm telling you, not just go talk to them. You're not going to go in and be able to see them, and if you did, they'll think you're crazy. Just like I said, what you do is, if you get involved in a political campaign and they're volunteering, say, for instance, on a Saturday night, you're staying at the campaign headquarters, and you're stuffing envelopes and working. Everybody else is out partying and drinking and having a good time. But you're out there working in this campaign. You know what happens on that late night, most nights, after the candidate comes home and talks to his staff and is sitting around talking? The businessmen and women who have been giving campaign contributions and are trying to get this guy elected so that he can do things or she can do things, that will benefit his business or her business. They'll come in and to talk and say, how did it go? This is what I think you ought to be doing. And this is what we'll do to help you and that sort of thing. And when you're leaving, you will go, who's that kid there working on a Saturday night when they ought to be out when they, you know, most of that partying and drinking and causing trouble. Oh, she's real smart. He's real smart. 
They 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 wanted to get involved. They they want to go places. I like that. He'll walk over maybe. He'll give you his business card. I said, I'm so and so. I'm I'm chairman of the board of this big corporation here in town. And I'm looking for young people that really are serious about doing a good job and moving forward and doing hard work in order to get there. You're showing me that. Come see me. Maybe we can find something for you. Because you're the kind of person I'd like working for me. And you're going, uh, okay, thank you. That's how you get ahead. That's how you get ahead. Or you can just sit at home and you know, or, or work at McDonald's. I mean, hey, you know, three dollars uh, and two two dollars an hour is not bad. You never get rich. You never move forward, but you can. And getting involved in politics is just one way. So I, that that that's government one on one in terms of helping yourself. But let's talk about political parties. What is a political party to begin with? Uh, it's an organization influenced by political ideology, ideas of what they want, whose primary purpose is to gain control of government by winning elections. The two major parties are organized at four levels, national, state, county, and precinct. Each political party is loosely organized. Uh, so that state and local party organizations are free to decide their positions on party issues. As mandated by the Texas Election Code, Texas's two major parties are alike in its structure. There's a Texas, there's a temporary party organization. The temporary party organizations are the organizations are the convention and primaries, the conventions and primaries conducted by the parties. Uh, there have been court battles about redistricting legislative uh, lines or for legislative districts. And both party primaries were affected and the usual March election date was moved to May. Uh, this is in turn affected every party convention as well. You've got precinct conventions. Uh, there are open to parties, uh, the members of the party who voted earlier on election day uh, at the first primary or in early voting. Precinct conventions occur every even numbered year on the first Tuesday in March, on the first Tuesday in March. Delegates and alternative alternates are selected to attend the next higher party convention with resolutions to consider for the party's platform. By the way, this is how you can get started in politics. Go vote, then show up at that precinct where you voted, whether it be in the Republican or Democratic primary, if you voted in the, see, by the way, you don't sign a card saying, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. You're a Democrat if you go vote in the Democratic primary because your ballot is stamped Democrat. If you go vote in the Republican primary, they'll stamp your card there and say Republican. Now, let's say then you went and voted now it's the polls are closed. That night you can come back and take part in the precinct convention. Like you show up at the public school where you went and voted. And that night they'll have a Democratic convention, precinct convention, and a Republican precinct convention. Yeah, the Democrats will be in the cafetorium, you know, the auditorium slash cafeteria. And the Republicans are in the library, maybe. And if you voted in the Republican primary, you will go to the Republican precinct convention. And what goes on in that precinct convention? Same way with the Democrats. Uh, you'll discuss about the issues you want to see happen in Texas and the position your party that you voted in needs to take in order to achieve the things you want to be seeing. And y'all will vote a delegate to go to the county convention where delegates from all the precincts meet a month or so later to decide on behalf of Harris County, McLennan, uh, McLennan County, Waco, where I used to live. That's why it came up right away. Fort Bend County, where I live now. 
you go to the priest, the county convention, uh, if you get uh, be the delegate from your precinct. And what happens there? Everybody from all the precincts in the county get together and talk about issues and what needs to be done for the party and the, the, and the county's party platform. And then you elect delegates to go to the state convention for the Republican Party, the state convention for the Democratic Party, if you're over there. There you meet movers and shakers from all over the state of Texas. And you'll meet candidates for statewide office. And if it's a presidential election, you might even have presidential candidates show up at the state party convention. Uh, I met Jesse Jackson at one. I, 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 I've seen candidates at one. Uh, and if you're, if you're moving there to that level, you're meeting people who are indeed the leaders of the state of Texas, be it Republican or Democrat. So this is something that is not only what we're studying, it's also a pathway that you could possibly use if you're in the slightest bit interested in public service and in also advancing your career in professional and, and financial areas. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a way of doing it. It's a way of meeting people that can help you and are willing to help you because they think you've got gumption and brains. Because if you're there, you're showing your gumption and you're showing your brains. The dumb ones stay at home. Uh, the, the folks that don't have any uh, desire to move ahead generally, yeah, I don't, I don't get involved in politics. Uh, now, if you're just worried that oh, I don't know anything about it, hey, ask, ask me. I'll tell you how to get started. Ask anybody that's involved in politics. They are tickled pink when a young person says, "I'm interested in doing this," and we'll bust our butt. They help you. So think about it. Just think about it from that standpoint. It just not just for where you got to do tests about this. So anyway. So state conventions, by the way, are held in June of even numbered years. Uh, uh, each Texas political party must hold a biannual state convention. At that convention, delegates select the state party chairman or woman the vice chair and members of the state executive committee, they draft a state party platform and reorganize or, or recognize, excuse me, the nominees that are selected in the primary elections. They also write rules for the party. Uh, they adopt a party platform, the position of the party, the state of Texas party, and adopt resolutions. If it's a presidential election year, which occurs every four years, every other two-year election cycle. Uh, if it's a presidential election year, state convention delegates also select delegates and alternatives, al alternates, excuse me, alternates to attend the national convention and, or, and potential members of the, the electoral college where the president is actually elected. Oh yeah, we vote for the president, but it's the electoral college that elects the president. We'll talk about that. And you're reading about it as well. Uh, and from the personal standpoint, remember it's to your advantage because you're meeting people that are top notch. I mean, the, I met the guy that became mayor of Houston at, at one of these things. Uh, I mean, and he was a powerful businessman. He was very influential. Uh, the Democratic Party selection. Uh, Texas Democrats combined the two delegate selection plans in a primary caucus described as a Texas two-step. Presidential candidates are awarded delegates to local and state conventions in proportion to the number of their supporters in attendance. National delegates included, include those who are selected by state senatorial districts, those selected on an at-large basis, basis, and what are called superdelegates. Republican selection. The Republican Party selects national delegates from the results of the presidential preference primary. Some Republican delegates are chosen by congressional district caucuses, three from each district. 
uh, others are chosen on an at-large basis by the entire uh, convention. And then you have a permanent party organization. At the national level, it's the uh, uh, permanent organization is the national committee. In Texas, the precinct chair, together with the county, district, and state executive committees, comprise the permanent organization of the state parties. The role of the permanent party organization is to recruit candidates, devise strategies, raise funds for the party, distribute candidate literature and information, register voters to be involved in our party, and turn out voters on election day. Uh, some of the officers, precinct chair. In uh, each precinct in the county, a precinct chair is elected in the primary for a two-year term. Chairs are, in law, are charged with registering and canvassing voters within the precinct, distributing candidate literature and information, operating phone banks within the precinct on behalf of the party and its candidates, and getting people to the polls to vote. A uh, precinct chair is an unpaid party official who also arranges for the precinct convention and serves on the county executive committee for the party. County and district executive committees, the county chair and precinct chairs from within the county are members of the county executive committee. They conduct primary elections and arrange for the county and district conventions. District executive committees are comprised of the county chairs from each county in a given district and rarely meet except to nominate candidates to fill a district vacancy. And then the state executive committee on the state level. For Republicans and Democrats, the state executive committee is the highest permanent party organization in the state. Uh, at the state convention, one man and woman, one woman are selected from each of the 31 senatorial districts, I have to shout over the dogs barking because somebody's delivering something at the front door. Isn't it fun working at home? Mm. <laughs> uh, at the high, anyway, for Republicans and Democrats, the State Electric uh, Executive Committee is the highest permanent party organization in the state. At the state convention, one man and one woman are selected from each of the 31 senatorial districts for membership on the state executive committee. These 62 members, plus a chair and a vice chair, are responsible for raising money to operate the state's headquarters, uh, party headquarters, and maintaining good relations with the national committees. Also, they recruit candidates and plan statewide meetings and strategies. They add on members, uh, add on members, excuse me, add on members are permitted to represent certain groups within the party. Okay. Uh, I heard somebody talking. Is there a question? Somebody has your mic on. You might want to mute yourself. I can hear you, and that means everybody else can. So you might want to mute your, uh, your thing. Okay, excuse me, I'm seeing what's going on. Well, I hope the dogs aren't walking out on me or anything. They're big dogs. Political ideology. Ooh, that's interesting. What's the difference between a liberal and conservative? Now, since the 1930s, the terms liberal and conservative have meant more to many Texans Texas voters than the names of political parties. The definition of the two changed with time and circumstances. In Texas, because of the influences of the individualistic and traditional culture, tr traditionalistic political cultures, both Democrats and Republicans tend to be conservative. Uh, by the way, the individualistic political culture believes that the individual makes their own decisions. Traditionalistic political culture says we need to do things the way they have been done and stick with it. A conservative mentality. Uh, both Democrats and Republicans tend in Texas to be, because individualistic and political cultures are, were, have been big in Texas, tend to be conservative. But the Republican Party organization is dominated by right wing, meaning far right, very conservative, social conservative 
whereas the Democratic Party is influenced but not dominated by left-wing liberals. Uh, when we talk about left-wing, we're talking about people who are liberal. In other words, hey, we believe in civil rights. We believe in uh, 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 aid to uh, the poor, aid to uh, uh, the elderly. Uh, conservatives say, you know, hey, if you can't make it, you, you, you're on your own. Not quite that bad, but that's generally the direction. Conservatism, conservatism in its purest form, uh, centers on a belief in the absence of excessive government regulations on social and economic matters. A conservative believes that good society derives from the sum of the best efforts of individuals, largely unfettered, uncontrolled by external governmental restraints. Social religious conservatism, conservatism adds to this a degree of to reverse some social developments of the past half century and advocates a virtual ban on abortion, which they've achieved course, because abortion has been, because of the, uh, Mr. Trump promising uh, s social and religious conservatives that he would, if elected, would end, put people on the Supreme Court who would end abortion, period. And he did. And they did. They overturned Roe versus Wade, the abortion decision in the early 1960s. Uh, if you're a woman, forget about getting an abortion in Texas because it's illegal. Not only by the Supreme Court, but by laws passed by the Republican leadership that control Texas politics. Uh, uh, social and religious conservatives, like I said, adds to this desire to reverse some social uh, decisions uh, of the past century, like the ban on abortion, no special protection for homosexual, homosexuals, and restoration of prayer in the public schools. Uh, Republican government governors have always, in the past years, here recently, considered themselves to be a social conser social conservatives, uh, and there are the party conservative movement in the Republican Party has been. Um, the wave, and, and that's the only direction the waves are going. Liberals believe that the government should regulate the economy to more equally distribute and equitably distribute the wealth. Furthermore, the accidents of the free market can't be depended on to produce a sufficiency of public goods, which may include education. Excuse me. It includes education transportation, various social and human services. While liberals seek to strengthen government power and regulation of the economy, they seek uh, to limit government power in regards to social matters. Support for this position is not as strong in Texas as it is in northern states. Uh, in terms of our political history in Texas, from the 1840s to the 70s, the party system originated uh, from annexation to secession, Texas politics turned on pro-Houston and anti-Houston uh, factions. And by the 1850s, the pro-Houston faction was nationalistic and began referring to itself as the Jackson Democrats. And the anti-Houston faction called itself the Calhoun Democrats, conservative, and was for state rights and achieving secession and controlling state politics through the Civil War. You know, yay, uh, yay, uh, Southerners, because uh, you know, got to keep our slaves, right? That was the attitude for the uh, for for the for the Southern Democrats. Uh, during Reconstruction, after the Civil War, Republicans controlled the state until they were ousted in the 1873 election. However, after living life under Republican governors E.J. Davis, Texas swung back to the Democratic Party. And E.J. Davis was a good Tim, was was a good governor, and in fact, after E.J. Davis was ousted from office, Texas didn't elect another Republican government governor for more than a century. Uh, but by that century passing, the Republican was not an E.J. Davis kind of mentality who was interested in e e equality of the races. 
uh, the Republicans became the more segregationist in the South. From the 1870s to the 1970s, one party domination. During that this period, Texas and other former Confederate states had a one party identity in which the Democratic Party was strong and the Republican Party weak. The Democratic Party was segregationist, the Republicans were not, following the pathway of, uh, of Lincoln. But during the first half of the 20th century, uh, Democrats were near absolute, having absolute power in the state uh, government with only a handful of Republicans winning uh, local officer seats in the House of Representatives. Conservative Democrats began voting Republican, though, for national office in the 1950s. Uh, in 19, because a lot of the national Democrats were becoming, uh, were working hard to desegregate the nation. In the 1976 election, Donald Reagan, Ronald Reagan drew thousands of conservative Democrats into the first Republican presidential primary, and most of them made the change permanent. 70s to the 1990s, uh, two-party system emerging. Republicans continued their political gains, electing governors in 78, 86, 94, 98, and beyond. Uh, by 2000, they controlled all state executive and judicial offices. Texas became a two-tiered, two-party state with Republicans holding most statewide offices and Democrats holding most local offices and the House of Representatives. George Bush, Bush won 70% of the vote in his re-election in, in, to the governorship in 1998 uh, with strong Democratic support. 2000 to 2012, Republican dominance. Republicans swept the 2000 elections back then. George Bush received 60% of the state's presidential votes. Republicans controlled all except the House of Representatives at the state level. Uh, but the Republicans swept the 2002 election, enlarging the Senate majority. Uh, in the presidential election of 2008, Barack Obama uh, uh, was the first well, but became the second Democratic presidential candidate in history to be elected without carrying Texas. Although Obama didn't carry the state, Democrats did well in other areas. In 2010, Republican candidates once again were elected to all statewide offices. They maintained their majority in the Senate and extended the majority in the House, winning 99 seats to the Democrats' 50, 51. When the two Democrats, when two Democrats switched to the Republican Party that same year, the House found that they enjoyed a supermajority for the first time. Uh, Republican Party today has almost complete control of the state uh, and all three branches of government. The executive, with Governor Abbott, uh, Dan Patrick is lieutenant governor, who's kind of like the vice president of the state. Uh, uh, and other executives are all held by Republicans. Both houses and the legislature are controlled by a Republican majority and virtually all justices on the two high courts, the Texas Supreme Court, which handles civil uh, uh, appeals on the highest level, and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. They're Republicans. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump won Texas' 36 electoral college votes in the 2016 uh, general election with 52% of the state's popular vote, defeating Hillary Clinton, the Democratic presidential candidate, who garnered 43% of the Texas vote. Uh, okay, we've got about 10 minutes left. Electoral trends. Over the last 30 years, Democrats and Republican parties have brought more women in African Americans into the state party systems, political systems, party politics have become more competitive and more nationalized. Political scientists are split on whether Texas is experience, experiencing a dealignment or a realignment. While that alignment argument continues, there's no doubt that straight ticket voting has declined in Texas. Where I'm going to, I'm a Democrat. I'm voting for all Democrats. I'm a Republican. I'm voting for all Republicans. Uh, that's what we're, where we are. You're gonna, if you're a Democrat, you're going to vote all Democrats. You're not going to vote for any Republicans and vice versa. Used to be you'd 
pick and choose. A lot of people would. Third parties, uh, they're minor parties. In other words, we've got a two-party system in America, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, Americans commonly uh, apply that term, third party or minor party, to any political party other than the Democratic or Republican Party. A number of third parties have been active in Texas, including Populist Party, La Raza Unita, Roth Perot's Reform Party, he ran for office, uh, the Libertarian Party, the Greenback Party, uh, Socialist Party, Socialist Labor, Green Party. These third parties have had some small success, but never more than 3% of the popular vote. Independent candidates are candidates who have no party affiliation. Their success is less likely as they actually lack any ready-made campaign organization and fundraising activities. Due to these limitations, independents have difficulty in gaining ballot access, getting on the ballot to even run. Voters who don't identify with either the Democratic or Republican parties are termed independent voters. Uh, voting in elections. Well, I'll tell you what, continue. These are, you got notes on this as well. Continue working on these notes. I wanted to hit on one other thing before we, because we're about to close here. There's some other things in, in terms of political participation that I wanted to address that's, uh, 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 well, let's see. Well, we talked about the fact that the Democratic Party was pro-slavery. Pro we talked about that. Uh, We'll, we need to talk about interest groups, special interest groups, and the role they play in the political process. Uh, things like business organizations like uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the NAM, the National Association of Manufacturers, the National Automobile Association. Those are national groups. I worked in the Texas group, and there are Texas groups, the Texas uh, uh Automobile Dealers Association, the Texas Chamber of Commerce. Instead of the American Medical Association, we have in Texas a Texas Medical Association. Uh, labor unions, AFL-CIO, there are Texas chapters of the AFL-CIO. Uh, when I campaigned for office, I ran for office in Central Texas, um, I campaigned uh, at the labor halls. I campaigned everywhere. In fact, uh, I'd run several congressional campaigns in the Republican. I ran. My, I worked for a congressman for a while, and I ran his campaign his in his last campaign, and the Republicans felt they could beat him. He'd been in office for forty years, he, older gentleman, and but brilliant it, in, in his in his eighties. For God's sakes, he was smarter than all of us put together. And here, our total IQ probably, uh, but. Uh, the Republicans wanted to hire me, and I was while honored by that because I respected back back then. You could I could deal with Republicans. Today that's very difficult to do because we've become so separated thanks to Donald Trump. Republicans have become far to the right, and Democrats by and large have become far to the left. Ultra liberals control the Democratic Party now, and ultra conservatives, uh, you know, Democrats would say they're 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 Nazis, they're fascists, and the Republicans, uh, the Trump Republicans today, call Democrats communists. So we're at that stage where we're so separated that people talk about another civil war. I don't think we'll go there. God forbid that it would be. So pray for that for sure, not to get any worse. But we're in, we're in a we're in a pickle. We're in a pickle because we can't talk any longer. You can, uh, Republicans don't talk to Democrats, and Democrats don't talk to Republicans. Like I said, I was honored to be offered a job by the Republicans. I turned it down, but I was 
I was touched and I appreciated it. And I, I considered that the party chairman was a friend of mine, the Republican Party chairman. Today, I doubt that the Republican Party chairman would want to be my friend. And I don't know if I could be their friend because it's just such vitriol between the two parties, which is for the country. Hello? Hey. What'd you say? Uh, someone said something. Was it a question? Were you having a heart attack? <laughs> Time, to Time to quit in just a few minutes. Five, four more minutes here. Uh, anyway, we've got to talk about voting in elections and campaigns, uh, Latinos, the voting process, some of the things that have been uh, done in the in, in the Supreme Court about voting, uh, women in politics, uh, the idea of we've had literacy tests, grandfather clauses, poll taxes, all white primaries, racial gerrymandering, diluting minority votes. Uh, but we've had federal voting rights legislation to getting greater voter turnout. There's all sorts of things about political participation we have to talk about and things that you need to learn about so that you can improve your lives and your family lives. Because if you need help, the government will be there, but you've got to know who to talk to and you've got to know how to be able to influence government. And it's not that hard, but you don't, if you don't have the knowledge, you can't do it. That means somebody else is getting the benefit of federal help or state help. And if you know what you're doing about politics, you can improve your life tremendously. Or you can just sit back and let other people get it. It's your money. You pay taxes. Remember the first time you got a job and, 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 and you got your first paycheck and you're looking at it and you're going, oh, wow. Well, hey, this says that you took something called FIFA and took my money and paid FIFA. Who's FIFA? Those are federal income taxes. I didn't want to do that. Well, I know, but you got to. You got to pay your taxes, some federal taxes, and, and we do that automatically, get it out for you. I don't want to do that. Well, if you don't, they'll put you in jail. Oh, oh, that's not right. Well, if you want to change some of that, you get involved in politics and maybe change some of the tax laws. That can be done. Those things happen. But if you don't get off your duff, you're stuck with what other people tell you to do. Be your own power. Be your own force. Control your own destiny. And that, knowing this, gives you that power. Wouldn't it be great to have that kind of power? It's all up to you. And anytime you need any help, I'm here for you. Because that's what I used to do and still will. Uh, so... Anyway, we're about out of our uh, revised time here, and uh, we will continue in our next meeting and uh, read your materials and uh, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Email me anytime you have a question or you need any help. I'm there for you and willing to be a uh, support. Uh, uh, with regard to anything that you're working on. So let me know how I can help. Any questions? Any comments? Any jokes? Well, then I'm going to say bye. Y'all have a good uh, week. Uh, you too. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you. Someone asked Thank You're you. You're welcome. You're very welcome. And whoever wrote me just then a note about reopening test one, uh, let me know uh, if you have a problem about test one. I'm not going to reopen the test for everybody, but if if there's a problem, I need to know about it. So contact me. That's the first I've heard of a problem. But someone just put a note up, and that's why I was asking. So if you've got any problems, write me. So I know what the problem is, and I will help you with it, okay? Write me, email me, and email me from your Canvas inbox, that mailbox, because 
I'll get it on my HCC email because uh, I have it set up to get that and it'll come to me and I will know what class you're in because if I don't know what class you're in, I got, you know, like 300, two or a couple of hundred students this semester. And I, while I know your name right now and you were in this class, I can't remember 300 people in matching with the class. Uh, the brain's only this big, so. And there's no hair protecting it. I'll see you later. Take care. Have a good week and stay in touch. Let me know how I can help you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Have a good one. And good luck. Bye. Bye, Jan. Bye, Hussein. Savannah. Bye-bye. Donovan. Take care. Bye-bye. I'm going to shut her down now. Take care.